Okay, so, uh, so I'm Daniel Blackburn, I'm with Funware. I figure it's after lunch on a Friday afternoon. I'm standing between you and happy hour. Um, we'll try to keep it light today. I figured I'll, uh, you've been staring at people up at the podium all day today, so I figure I'll walk around a little bit. Um, so um, the goal for today is really for, um, for really all of you who are joining to be able to take away just um, two or three specific themes or, or strategies um, to go back to your organizations and have conversations around um, where does mobile fit within your strategy, um, whether you're an OTT provider or whatever the case is, um, specifically around media and entertainment. Now, we only have 20 minutes. Um, any one of these concepts we could probably spend at least an hour on. So that being said, please feel free to um, find us after the, uh, after the, sh uh, after the session. Um, we'll grab a drink. We'll talk a little bit about your specific pain and passion points. If you have any specific questions on this, obviously there's time at the end, but um, I should not stand there. But uh, we'll just go ahead and we'll jump into it. Um, so that's me. So I look after the media and entertainment practice at Funware. Um, we essentially act as an outsourced product development um, organization for media and entertainment companies. So whether you're um, a big broadcaster looking to move from um, linear to uh, TV everywhere to over the top, um, that's what we do. Um, or if you're an OTT provider or you're somehow trying to monetize specific content, back catalog, whatever the case is, you're looking to go over the top, we essentially work across the entire mobile life cycle to help you to be able to do that. So let's start, uh, I guess a natural place to start is in the challenge, I don't think, or excuse me, in the opportunity. This is what everyone's after, right? So we all have the content, we want to get it direct to the consumers, try to disintermediate, um, uh, all those intermediary steps between um, your content and your distribution to the end user. And I think the real key takeaway here is, you know, second from the top there, uh, content consumers are spending more than five hours um, a day on their mobile phones. So from a content perspective, you want to be where your consumers are. Um, and so that represents um, both, uh, I guess, the challenge and the opportunity. Now, hopefully, you know, you look at this slide and you think about the people in your own organization and think about all of the different complexities required in actually delivering that content out to the end user, right? So we'll spend a little bit about around product delivery today, um, but also there's content and acquisition, or excuse me, content uh, acquisition and retention. Um, someone has to be in charge of engagement, right? It's, at the end of the day, product is delivered, um, and then there's someone else driving acquisition, but what about when people are there are they coming back? Do they like the experience? Is it good? Is it bad? Um, and then also increasingly, design and user experience. So um, suddenly, right, you're a content company and now you actually have to be a product company. And as a part of that, you really have to think about specific design um, uh, patterns around Android, iOS, uh, the 12 foot experience, you know, small screen, large screen, everything else in between. And what becomes really difficult at that point is um, a lot of organizations, especially large content organizations, don't have these skill sets in-house. So they either have to turn to someone like a Funware or some other sort of partner um, in the meantime while they skill those up, right? So we'll talk, you know, so all of these represent some specific challenges. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the mobile um, uh, application lifecycle. So um, this is how Funware sees the world. Okay, and, and this is one structure that you can use, whether you're thinking about it from an operations perspective, from a strategy perspective, or even from a personnel perspective. Um, but essentially, you think first of all in terms of like a strategy or, or on the business side of things, right? What does our roadmap look like? How do you prioritize? Some content companies essentially have the luxury of saying, I wanna be everywhere where my customer is, right? So we have customers who come to us and say, I'm gonna be across Android, iOS, tvOS, smart TV, Xbox, PlayStation, Roku, channels, and everything in between. Now, the larger of an organization you are, um, that's actually pretty easy, that's a nice strategy to have, right? I'm gonna be everywhere where my consumers are, right? Which is everywhere. Um, the further you, down you go, as far as from an organization perspective, you actually have to make some really tough decisions. Um, which do I start with? Right? Um, which do I say, I'm gonna wait and see? Um, which are the platforms I'm just not gonna support at all? Right? So that's really in this strategy bucket. 
Um, and then this is where most organizations spend the majority of their time, which is how do I actually build these applications? Um, is it complete custom development? Do I leverage a platform? Do I lease specific SDKs? Do I do a lot of um, custom development, but then I just pick and choose best of breeds, uh, like analytics and push messaging, and you basically have um, lots of ingredients into your same um, uh, uh, sort of uh, application portfolio. Once it's built, it has to be launched, right? So this is typically where you engage an agency or you start to talk about cost per install campaigns, um, how much am I willing to pay to, ac to acquire a user? Um, and then this is the, the piece that very often time is neglected, right? So once people actually have the application, are they watching one show or are they watching 10 shows? Are they watching, coming back twice a week or are they coming back twice a month? And the ability to drive engagement in the application really um, speaks to the monetization piece. So whether you're an SVOD, um, or you're an AVOD, right? So if you have advertising or you're charging subscriptions, um, if you're an OTT provider, this is your bread and butter. Now we put data right in the middle because essentially data um, in all of its forms, whether it's first party or third party, can help to drive decision making at, e at each one of these pieces. Now, when we say specifically that this is Funware's view of the world, um, a long time ago, 2009, our corporate vision was to be able to service any one customer across this entire life cycle. Now, that seems like boiling the ocean, um, and cert certainly there's lots of different options at every individual piece here, but um, the, the most interesting work that I've seen us do at Funware, specifically in the media and entertainment space, has generally been at the intersections between one or more of these stages. So it's easy to say this is cyclical, you move from one to another, I've got a marketing manager and I've also got a, a, a product delivery team, right? And then everyone stays in their lane, right? Um, actually, the most interesting part about it, and I think where a lot of the value of someone specifically like Funware, is the ability to see this holistically and address those business problems in between those stages. So the first, thing that I, the first theme that I wanted to cover today was this mentality of project management versus product management. So in a lot of organizations, the idea of delivering on the product or the applications themselves has happened really organically, okay? So um, about you know, a year and a half, two years ago, um, we would get a lot of these conversations where someone would call us up and say, Hey, Funware, I know you've built thousands of apps. I understand you understand you know, how to deliver video X, Y, Z. We don't want everything at once. We need a proof of concept, right? Which is fine. Like, we are going to start with iOS. We're going to roll it out. We're going to see how it goes. And if it's good, then we'll continue to roll everything out. Um, and we almost deliver that first, um, that first project as a, as, you know, as a singular piece, a very discrete project. And the way that you deliver against that versus delivering against a product which has a long-term roadmap across multiple um, uh, platforms is very different. So the ways that it's actually different are actually on this slide here, right? So the project mentality is very near-term horizon, right? So you're just thinking about getting that thing out the door, right? And this is typically um, project management, right? The product mentality has a longer term view, longer term horizon, and we're focusing on scale. We're focusing on um, reusability of code, right? And you're trying to future proof it for the future. So there's a terminology which is um, the software development life cycle, right? So your SDLC. Now, if any one of you have ever is, is on the business side of things and you're less technical, like me, and you've talked to your head of engineering and they've said something like, you can't just throw people at this. Has anyone ever heard that before? Right? Like there's diminishing returns for each additional developer that you put um, in your ability to, like, from a velocity perspective, to achieve your goals. They're only half right. Okay? If you're midstream in a project and you're falling behind in your timeline, throwing more people at it may get you there. Diminishing returns. Okay? However, 
if the project was started ahead of time and created in a way and structured in a way with a more, I'd say, advanced or modern SDLC, then you have the ability to scale much differently, okay? Um, we actually had um, a client come to us and say, you know, this relationship has grown very organically. Um, you know, it started with one platform, then we decided to go another, another, another. But we think that based on next year, we're gonna need to double the size. We, we're gonna need to double our velocity. How can you maintain your level of quality and give us that scale? And it's difficult because you have to make a really hard decision because you have to break your SDLC. You basically have to say, everything that we've done from now until, from when we've begun until now, we have to do it differently, okay? Um, uh, Uber, funny enough, has an engineering blog, and they talk a lot about how they've changed their SDLC over time, specifically um, to address some of these challenges. We won't go really deep into this, um, but two of the ways that you can update your SDLC to get additional scale and reusability is through abstraction and stratification. So abstraction, and for all the engineers in the room, they, they understand this is just a way of life, right? But is the ability to um, abstract certain teams away from their core team, so you actually have core developers working on, excuse me, on your primary features, while you have different teams focusing on other areas that are very discreet, so that it doesn't take away focus or velocity from that, um, from that team. So as an example, in this scenario, um, you have a legacy and maintenance team, right? So if, you're, if you own a project roadmap and you're just trying to get out the door, there's always technical debt, okay? And when you decide to address that technical debt is a strategic decision around you're either gonna keep going and sort of keep digging your hole, or do you, if you have your existing team addressing the technical debt, then your velocity goes down in terms of your ability to, deli to deliver on your roadmap, right? So what we actually do is we abstract a, a team out of the core team, and they have their own sprints and grooming process and whatnot to address the backlog versus um, these other, what I would call, core teams. The other thing that you can do is you can have framework teams, where the framework teams actually specifically work on things that is gonna be reusable across your Android platforms and across your iOS platforms. So now you have almost people building your own SDKs internally, right, that are like separate branch, separate development process, um, and can be merged in after the fact, okay? Now once you start to do things like this, um, you won't run into the problem of I'm maxing out at 10 devs or 12 devs or 20 devs because you can have certain people working in figuratively further proximity from each other where you don't get those diminishing returns. There's a lot here, don't worry, we're not gonna go over all this. The other thing is stratification. So stratification essentially, if you look at these three concentric circles, if you choose to um, divide your work up a certain way, you can have two things. Number one, um, across the different layers of the outside of this circle, um, you can have um, different levels of seniority of resources, and it opens up the conversation to offshore as well. So we would say, as an example, um, within the blue and within the orange has to be onshore. This, this is how we do things. However, if you really want to have cost efficiencies and move some, and move some of the work um, offshore, offshore or nearshore, um, we would feel comfortable in the production layer, but not in the core development, as an example. But once you start to do this, what you'll find is just in one part of the pie, if you look on the right-hand side, in this particular scenario, you might have up to 24 people working just in iOS on that particular section or that particular feature of the application. Now, I've been in organizations that would struggle to get 24 people on an entire project coordinated in a way that they're not stepping all over each other and your risk just goes through the roof, right? Um, but in this particular case, 24 and just that, you can see where your scalability and your future proof starts to go up. Now, some of this goes back to 
at some point someone in the organization who's probably not technical is going to say something like, I just read that Twitter has 100 devs, right? Why can't, why am I maxing out at 10, right? They don't understand, right? So half of this is the ability to ahead of time structure your teams and your SDLC specifically around capturing, um, capturing that scale. Second theme, our six favorite letters. Um, really focusing on lifetime value um, and cost per install, okay? Now, we have a lot of conversations around both of these independently within Funware, as well as um, as a group or, or, or how they interact with each other, right? But whether you're an SVOD and you're trying to get paid subscribers or you're an AVOD, there's always going to be some sort of lifetime value metric, okay? But if you really, really focus on instrumenting each of those individually and then thinking of them together, if ultimately you can drive your cost per install down and your lifetime value up, then you can effectively get to the place where you can buy revenue, right? No one would have a problem if you basically say, I will hand you you know, I will gladly pay you $1 if you give me $3 back, right? Ha happy to do that. And then at that point, when someone comes to you with a revenue target, you're only throttled by your ability to buy that inventory and to hit that cost per install, okay? So it's like, how much do you wanna make, how much do you wanna make today? Wanna make a million dollars? Throw it in this equation, I know what my cost per install is, I know my lifetime value, give me that marketing spend. You're buying revenue, okay? Um, However, there's a lot of focus normally on cost per install, and that typically happens in a, um, sometimes in an agency environment. But the lifetime value, um, if you have the inverse of that, and your lifetime value is $3, and your cost per install is $7, you really need to try to instrument those two things um, to try to get that ratio right. Now, maybe that's not rocket science, of course, Cost, lower cost per install, great. However, thinking about them together and understanding, as an example, the same people who built the app and understand the feature benefits and understands your audience, who, is, who also can then help you with your lifetime value by driving engagement, while at the same time, those same people who can be doing your media buying for you, as an example, um, as opposed to trying to get three people who work for different organizations together to collaborate, Having it all under one roof is, um, again, speaks to the value proposition that, um, that Funware brings. Uh, what does that look like? Lots of different activities specifically in each of these. Um, the one thing that I'll call out specifically, for those of you who are using push alerts today, easy place to start, right? Don't think of those as blind, I mean, there's things that should be broadcast, right? But that is CRM for mobile, right? You really need to think about that in terms of segments, data-driven, right? Driving specific behavior within the application itself. And so if your platform internally to drive to, if you only have broadcast capabilities and you can't get those into specific segments and send a particular message to a particular type of consumer, um, you're really leaving a lot on the table, right? Um, that's one of the ways, as an example, of putting a certain person in charge of just driving engagement, excuse me, which is ultimately lifetime value. The last piece is data. Um, everyone wants to talk about the big and big data. Um, Funware today sees about 800 million uniques on our data platform today. Um, because we work across the entire um, uh, application lifecycle. We have ad tech, we have SDKs that are installed in you know, thousands of applications out there, and we do bespoke development as well. So we have anonymized data that's available um, for app, um, uh, for anyone who has an application essentially to um, leverage that data. And so there's, there's three things as an example that you can do with data. 
The first is you can leverage it for user insights to inform new product um, feature prioritization. Okay, so as an example, um, what's a good one? So, so Funware, as an example, can see um, users of applications in our geo, in, with our geolocation technology who go to airports. We have geofenced airports, right? And there's some sort of derived data to get us to, we've actually flagged some certain users as business travelers, okay? So how many of you, as an example, in your application, it would be valuable to know how many of your application, uh, your users are business travelers. Maybe, maybe not, right? Maybe you're trying to, maybe you're trying to sell ads to B2B or whatever the case is. Um, but what about something like offline viewing? It's like, is offline viewing important to your users? I don't know, some people say yes, some people say no. Um, for the people who say yes, you might, like, would it change that decision-making process if you know that one in three of your heaviest users are on a plane, you know, more than twice a month? That's how you can leverage the data in that strategy and roadmap decision uh, process. The other, and I, and I touched on this from a mobile CRM perspective, inform in-app messaging to drive high-value tasks and reduce churn, right? So if you're... If your internal analytics, as an example, tells you that right before somebody turns off, like the likelihood of someone turning is more if they only watch one show, right? Like maybe they watch several episodes, but they basically have your app because they like one thing. How much more valuable will it be, as an example, if you get that person to, from watching one show to two shows? And that incremental lift basically would reduce your churn over your entire user base by X and things of that nature. Right? So what we're able to do is able to tell you a little bit more about the usage behavior, not within your app, but outside of your app. Right? So you start to find a lot more um, interesting commonalities of potentially your highest value users. Right? So that'd be another use case. Um, and then the last one is fairly you know, straightforward. Everyone's already doing this today. Um, segment your lifetime value, or uh, segment your high lifetime value customers for your media campaigns. I'm getting the wrap up. I'll skip this, but you can talk to me about it later over a beer. So to wrap up, your guide to success. First of all, go back, have a conversation with your teams. Do you feel like, it's like, there's this guy who was talking, he said something about product mentality versus project mentality. What, do we feel like we have a pretty modern SDLC? If someone says the word waterfall, like probably time to call Funware, right? You wanna be somewhere beyond that. Oops. Um, master that and instrument that CPI and LTV equation. And then lastly, um, use data throughout your entire life cycle. 20 minutes, it goes quick. Excellent, excellent job. Questions? Uh, first off, let's give a round of applause for Daniel.